Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody get some rest? No. All right, try that again tomorrow night. All right. <laughs> well, um, for you that, that know me, you've kind of seen pictures of my kids, but for you that uh, are new, I wanted to kind of introduce you to my kids. Uh, one of the things that I love uh, is being a dad, and uh, that's my son, Evan Daniel. He's five, and Lena Joy, she's seven, be eight next month. And uh, one of the things that I love about being a dad is, man, I love to ask my kids questions. So when I start off messages with questions or ask you a lot of questions, all right, just know that I do the same things to my kids on a daily basis. One of the things that I like to ask them though is sometimes like, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? That annoying question, right? You know, what, what, but what it reveals is sort of what they're dreaming about. And of course, at their ages, it, it changes sometimes weekly or monthly, right? But I, I love hearing about, about their dreams. Um, my, my daughter, uh, although she's only seven, has, thinks she's met her future husband at her homeschool group. Um, she has hopes and dreams of, of living in a white house in the woods. She wants to have two horses and eight chickens. Um, and so uh, I'm going to have to take care of that little boy. But uh, anyway, in fact, I told her, I said, I'm going to take him fishing. And she said, I have to come along. And I said, no, I think it'll just be some guy time. And she says, no, you'll hurt him. So <laughs> I was like, well, maybe. But. Evan's hopes and dreams right now, uh, unfortunately, center around marrying his mother. So um, he's looking for ways for, to take me out. So uh, he's informed me that if I die, that he's marrying mommy. So, which, I mean, I admire his, his taste, but uh, just trying to explain some things to him there. But I, I love hearing their, their hopes and dreams. They're both so different. Uh, this is Lena. She, uh, she used to be a princess. We used to have weddings, she had a wedding dress, now she's kind of gone country. Uh, and then uh, Evan, he likes to swing, and he likes his mama. So, a little, little introduction to my kids. Um, thinking about the subject of hope, uh, the reason that I introduced uh, that thought this morning is because as kids, we have hopes and dreams, don't we? Right, all of us as kids have hopes and dreams and we sort of imagine what we might be or, or what, how life might go. But one of the things that I've noticed in life, and maybe you're already there, is that sometimes life and reality have a way of, of getting in the way of our hopes and our dreams. In fact, sometimes life seems to crush hope. And hope becomes a very, very hard thing to find. Hope becomes something that's more of an illusion than it is a reality in our life. And it, and it could be something that happened to you, right? It could be something that was done to you. It, it could be circumstances. It, it could be your own choices or, or mistakes that have caused you to feel hopeless. But for whatever reason, sometimes life seems to take away our hope. And hope is something that we all need, right? Hope is a, a universal need of mankind. It's, it's a universal need and so people search for hope and they seek hope. And so what I want us to, uh, to uncover this week is, is really what God's Word has to say about this subject of hope and how hope is something that despite our circumstances and despite what life may throw at us, it's something that God wants us to have and to live in. And so we're going to be looking at some different passages and some different themes on hope this week. I wanted to begin uh, by sharing a, a portion of scripture that's not as well known as some, although you may have heard of this character. Uh, but we're going to talk this morning about a man named Mephibosheth. How many of you have heard of Mephibosheth? All right, most all of you. All right, so we're going to look at the story and life of Mephibosheth today because he sort of was living in a hopeless situation. But we're going to see how God gives Mephibosheth hope and then what that has to do with how we can experience hope today. So, if you have your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I do encourage you to bring your Bible to chapel. I often put uh, passages on the screen, but it's really important for you to have your own copy of God's Word and, uh, so that you can follow along. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, we're going to begin uh, by reading verses 1 through 4. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 9, and let's uh, just read the first four verses together. And David said, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? 
And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not some one of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, for he is crippled in his feet. Then the Lord said to him, Where is he? The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amael, at Lodabar. So we are introduced to a scene this morning where David is asking, is there someone from the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Now, on the surface, that might not seem like a big deal, but this is a pretty extraordinary thing, right? This is a pretty extraordinary thing because, of course, you remember Saul was the first king of Israel and David had been chosen to be the second king of Israel and Saul was not so happy about that. Right, And many times he tried to kill David. He threw javelins at him. He hunted him with his soldiers. Right? And so normally when you would become king and your predecessor was sort of hostile to you, you would get rid of or exile or kill all of any possible successors to your throne or, or competition. But yet David wants to show kindness and it had to do with his relationship with Jonathan, right, Saul's son whom he was friends. And so he inquires, is there anyone left that we could show kindness to? And Ziba says, yes, there's one son of, of, of Jonathan left, and his name is Mephibosheth, right? And he is crippled, and he's living in a place called Lodabar. How many of you think that sounds like a place you'd want to live? All right. Okay, I got like one person, they're like, wait a minute, no one else is moving there, I'm not going to go there either. All right, I don't know about you, but I, Lodabar just doesn't sound like a place that I would want to live. It literally means this. It means no communication, no word, no pasture. No communication, right? No cell phone service. Are you with me? No internet. No word. No pasture. Like Lodabar is a hopeless place. It's a hopeless place, but that's where Mephibosheth is living when we encounter this story. Life has been hard for him. Right? He was the grandson of Saul, and when Saul was fleeing, right, his nanny picked him up, and they were fleeing, and she dropped him. And he injured both of his legs. Right? I've only injured one of my legs. Right? I'm thankful that in this day we can get great medical care. But they didn't have that option right then. They were fleeing, right? And so he was dropped. His legs were probably broken and they never healed correctly. And so for the rest of his life, right, he lived crippled. But not only did he live crippled, right, he lived in fear, right? He lived in fear that, that, that the next king may try to take me out. And so I need to go into hiding. And so he chooses to live in low Debar. Not a hopeful place. Maybe... Maybe this morning you could say, you know what, I can kind of identify with Mephibosheth. I, 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 I can identify with him because maybe, maybe you'd say, like Mephibosheth, I've experienced, right, I, I've experienced suffering that was due to my circumstances. Right? Sometimes things just happen to us. For Mephibosheth, it was being dropped. Right? He was dropped physically. But maybe you say, you know, I, I've been dropped. May, you know, not, not physically, right? Although some of you may have been dropped physically. We were having a conversation right before we came to camp about, with our kids about falling and bumping their heads and, you know, sort of recounting how many times Evan has fallen on his head. And, and, and Lena says, I haven't fallen as much. And I said, no, but you did fall out of that, that chair you're sitting in a few times. And I said, that does explain some things. And she immediately said, you mean why I'm different? So... I don't know where that came from. But maybe life has, has dropped you somewhere. Somebody dropped you. A parent, a friend, circumstances. And you've been injured or damaged by that. Maybe physically, but maybe emotionally. Maybe spiritually. Or maybe like Mephibosheth, you've experienced suffering that was due to the sinful actions of others. Right? Because ultimately, right, ultimately, Mephibosheth's struggles become because Saul, his grandfather, became a godless man in many ways. He, he really ran away from God and didn't honor God, right? And that's why all this trouble came on Saul's house and his household, right? And sometimes in life, 
we experience suffering and difficulty because of what other people have done. Right? There, you know, one of the most important things that we can ever learn in life is that our actions do not just affect us. Right? Your choices ultimately always affect those around you. And sometimes those who will come long after you. And so maybe like Mephibosheth, you can identify this morning and say, you know what, stuff has happened to me. Right? It was sinful, it was evil, it was wrong. It shouldn't have happened like that. And because of that, I've been hurting and I've suffered. Maybe, maybe like Mephibosheth, you say, some of, my, some of my hopelessness comes from my own choices. Right? Sometimes, you know, it's something that happened, it was just circumstances. Sometimes it's sinful actions of others, but sometimes it's our own choices that leave us feeling hopeless, right? Our own decisions, our own failures, our own shortcomings, our own mistakes. We don't know why Mephibosheth was living in Lod Debar, but he was choosing to live there. No word, no communication, no pasture. And regardless of the cause, sometimes life leaves us feeling that way. But I want us to just see what God does in Mephibosheth's life. So let's continue in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and, and uh, go back to verse 5. It says, Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. Now, can you imagine... And if you were here last week, I talked about how I believe God's given us imagination for a purpose and a reason, right? And, and, and so I just want you for a moment to imagine your Mephibosheth. Can you do that this morning? Right, I know it's early, I know it's Monday, but can you just pretend you're Mephibosheth for a moment? All right, it's a little easier for me because I'm, I'm halfway there to Mephibosheth. But just pretend you're him for a moment. All right, can you imagine the hopelessness that you've lived in? Right, you've lived a life where you are unable to walk properly. You're, you're crippled in both your feet. You're lame. You, you have experienced the loss of your family. Your, your, your father was killed. Right? Your grandfather was killed. It was your grandfather's sinful actions that, that really messed up your life. And now you're living in low to bar. Can you imagine what it felt like? And then to be summoned before David, the king. And you have no idea why he wants you there. You don't know if he's brought you there because he's finally found out where you were living and he's come to take you out. Right? And, and you just sort of can imagine all of the emotions, all of the feelings that are going on in Mephibosheth. And then David says to him, Do not, what? Fear, for I will show you, what? Kindness. And then he promises him, I'm going to restore to you and your descendants the land that, that would have been rightfully yours. And I'm going to make sure that your needs are taken care of. In fact, you're going to eat at my table. You're going to eat of the best of the food. You will be taken care of and your family the rest of your life. And David chooses to treat Mephibosheth as his own son. Right? He, he treats him as though he is his own son. And he restores hope to Mephibosheth. You see, when all hope had seemed to be lost in his life, God restored hope through David. And Mephibosheth got to experience hope again. Now, we might be thinking about that and, and all those things, and I want us to just think about his identity, because up until this point, his identity has been forged through tragedy and pain. Right? His whole sense of identity has been formed through tragedy and through pain. But now everything has changed. And like I said, maybe, maybe you can identify with that. I mean, maybe you'd say, my identity has been formed through, through difficulty, through tragedy, through pain, through circumstances. I, I know what that's like. I feel that. I understand that. I understand that. Look at what happens as we continue the story. Verse 9. Well, actually read verse 8. It says, And he paid homage. That was Mephibosheth. And he says, What is your servant? that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. Right? You can see his, his identity has been forged so much that he calls himself a dead dog. How many of you would say that's pretty low? All right. 
Like when you start thinking of yourself as a dead dog, it's not a good place. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and, and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And to you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate always at the king's table. And now he was lame in both feet. Right? What, what happened in Mephibosheth's life was extraordinary. I mean, it was a remarkable, remarkable turnaround in his life. Right? Something amazing happens. Right? He goes from this most hopeless situation that was so painful and so difficult right? due to circumstances being dropped, due to the sinful actions of his grandfather Saul, due to his own choices, and yet now hope has been restored and David has showed him kindness and care and he is taken care of, his family is taken care of, and hope has been restored to him. It's really an extraordinary story. But I know what I sometimes think when I read passages like this. I, I ask this question. What about me? Right? Like, that's awesome for Mephibosheth. Woo! Go Mephibosheth. Are you with me? Like, we're happy for him. But you say, what about me? Right? I don't have David. I don't have a King David in my life. I don't have someone to do that for me. So what do I do? Well, no. No, you don't have a King David in your life. But I want you to know this morning that you have someone greater than David who wants to do for you what David did for Mephibosheth. You see, there was a son of David, a descendant of David, who was also David's creator. Jesus came to earth, the eternal Son of God. Right? Who had always existed. Colossians chapter 1 describes him as the creator of all things. It says all things were created by him. Right? All things were created through him and for him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, entered humanity as a physical descendant of David. And he came to announce and inaugurate his kingdom, his rule and his reign. He came to die so that those of us who are sinful and rebellious might be brought into his kingdom and we might know him and live in relationship with him now and for all of eternity. And then he ascended back to his father where he rules and he reigns and he's promised to come again in power and in glory. But until then, right, we live here in many ways when it feels like we're living in Lodabar, right, in a place that is hopeless. And in the midst of this place and in the midst of this journey, God wants to give you hope through Jesus. Jesus comes to offer you and I what David gave to Mephibosheth. Hope. Jesus offers you hope. I want you to know this morning that there is hope available to you. Right? Sometimes life feels and seems so hopeless and you feel cut off. But Jesus offers you a real, real hope. Right? He offers you hope for the hurts that have happened to you. He offers hope for the hurts that have happened to you. I don't know all the stuff that's happened to you. But I want you to know that what has happened to you, right, does not have to define you forever. And what has happened to you, God is actually able to take and work for good in your life. One of the amazing things that, that Jesus offers us is the opportunity to see things that were not good be used for good. In fact, Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says this, a familiar verse, but it's so powerful and sometimes so misunderstood. And Paul says there, he says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. He says, we know that in all things, not in some things, not in a few things, in all things, he says God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. All things are not good. Sometimes not good things happen. And this verse is not saying that what happened was good. It's saying that even though if it wasn't good, God is able to make it work for good in ways that we couldn't imagine or understand. 
And I want you to know that if, even if things have happened to you, circumstances have left you hurt in life, you've been dropped, Jesus is able to use that thing even for good in your life. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. There's hope for the hurts that have happened to you. I, I, my prayer for you this week is that you would know that deeply and that you would experience that hope. There's also hopes for the suffering that we've experienced due to others. Right? Jesus came to set us free from the curse and the consequence of sin. And part of that is also not just our sin, but the sins that have been done to us. And one of the things that, that God does for us in that is He gives us the power to forgive. Right? If you want to experience hope in the hurts that have been done to you, the sinful things, the, the actions that have been done to you, I want you to, the key to that is forgiveness. And, and forgiveness is not pretending that it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not saying that it didn't matter. Forgiveness is not saying that it wasn't evil. Right? Forgiveness is acknowledging it was evil, it was sinful, it shouldn't have been done, and it was wrong. But it is also acknowledging that God has unconditionally forgiven me in Christ. That He has forgiven me of all my sin, past, present, and future. He has not held me to my sin. He has forgiven me in Christ. And if I am forgiven in Christ, then I can freely give and freely share what God has given me. And again, forgiveness is not excusing, it's not overlooking, it's not pretending. It's just saying, what was done to me was wrong but I can forgive you. I can put it in God's hands. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to let my Father in Heaven handle this situation and this person. I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to seek payback. And when you do that, when you choose to put that in God's hands, you'll experience hope in the suffering that you've experienced. But there's also hope for your bad choices. There's hope for your bad choices. Right? All of us. Right? All of us have made choices at times that we regret. How many of you just say, I've made some choices I regret? All right, look around. All right, keep your hands up and look around. All right, isn't it good to know you're not the only one? Right, sometimes we feel like we're the only one. Like sometimes we feel like I'm just so dumb and I, I, I keep messing things up. And sometimes we look back and we say, man, I really, really regret some of the choices that I've made. I really regret them. And it's good sometimes to have sorrow, but I also want you to know there's hope. Right? There may be consequences to those choices. There may be things that, that you can't avoid because of that. But I want you to know that God can forgive. Right? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that God can forgive you. He's already paid for your sin in Christ. Right? And He can forgive you and He can heal and He can restore. And just because you've made some mistakes and just because you failed in some areas, your life is not over. All is not hopeless. Right? God is able to work in our life. It's easy to lose hope in life. It's easy to lose hope. But God, I believe with all of my heart that God desires that His children would be filled with His hope. Right? And when we shared that verse last night from Romans chapter 15 that, that Paul desired that the church, that they would experience the hope of God, that they would overflow in hope. And I believe that God desires that for all of our lives. And it's not about seeking out set of circumstances. It's not about chasing hope. It's about knowing and experiencing the one who is hope and who gives hope. Jesus said this the night before he went to the cross as he was with his disciples. And I'm so thankful John records so much of what happened that evening. And in John chapter 16 verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things, the stuff that he was sharing with them that night. He shared the most most personal things to his heart that night before he went to the cross. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. For in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. He says, he says in this life, Jesus didn't say, hey, everything's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. No, he said, in this, in this world you will have trouble. He says, you will have trouble. But he says, I, he says that in me you may have peace, but he says, take heart then because I have overcome the world. He says, you're going to have trouble in this world. Life will not always be easy. It will always make sense. You will get hurt, right? Circumstances will happen to you. You'll get dropped. People will do sinful things that affect your life, right? You'll make mistakes. You'll have regrets. But Jesus said, I've told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Listen, 
Jesus didn't just come into the world, swoop in, die on the cross, and go back to heaven. And he could have done that and paid for our sin. But Jesus came and he lived among us. The God of creation dwelt among his own people. And when Jesus was on earth, he experienced what it was like to be hurt. He experienced pain. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. Some of you have been betrayed. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be mocked. He knows what it's like to be humiliated. He knows what it's like to be let down by those closest to you. He knows what it's like to be promised, hey, we've got your back, and then to be let down. He knows what it's like to experience injustice. He knows what it's like to experience the pain and suffering that comes with it. I want you to know that, 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 you're, that the God of heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ, right? Jesus knows and cares about your hurt and your pain. See, Jesus who offers you hope today doesn't just offer it to you in some vacuum. He knows. He experienced. He knows the depth of what it, like, what it means to hurt and to be in pain. He cares. He is not unsympathetic and uncaring towards our pain. But here's the thing. Jesus does not just also know our hurt and our pain and our sorrow. He does not just know what it's like to go through those things. He also knows victory. Right? He also knows victory. And he offers you hope today. Jesus was honest about life. It won't always be easy. It won't always go the way we plan. Circumstances will often say, you shouldn't have hope. But our hope is not based on circumstance. Right? Our hope is based on a relationship that we're offered with God through Jesus Christ. Right? That by faith, we can come as sinful people and experience forgiveness of our sin. We can experience restored relationship with God. We can know Him personally. Right? He comes to live in us through His Spirit. And He's promised us that we will live in and for His kingdom forever. And so in that relationship that God offers you, He offers you hope. What David did for Mephibosheth was incredible. Right? It was incredible. He restored hope. But what Jesus did for you is even greater. And I want you to know that what David did for Mephibosheth is a picture of what Jesus does for you and for me. Hope is possible. Hope is available because hope is a person. Right? Hope is not something we seek out, out in the world. Jesus himself is our hope. Would you bow your heads this morning? And just before we begin what's going to be a busy day and a busy week, and I'm excited for for what God's going to do in your life, how He's going to stretch you and grow you this week. But just, just in this moment, how many of you would say, I came into this week, whether you were here last week or you just got here yesterday, how many of you would say, I, 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 I'm really struggling in this area of hope. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you? All right, thank you so much for your honesty and your courage. It's my prayer for you and for all of us that we'd experience God's hope. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Father, I thank you that your word tells us that you are the God of all hope. And Father, I pray this morning that, that each and every one of us would realize how greatly you desire for us to experience and live in your hope. And Father, I know this morning there's some people here who have indicated they, they are feeling hopeless. Hope is a struggle right now. Father, and most all of us have been there at some point. I've been there. Father, I pray that you would help them to know you in a greater way than they've ever known you before. Father, I pray that through Jesus they would experience that living hope that only you can provide. Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to us, that he experienced life with us, that he knows our hurt and our pain and our sorrow. Father, I thank you that you care. And Father, I pray that we might experience your hope in us. Father, I pray that we would experience the power of your Spirit giving us hope that we might live in a way that pleases you. And Father, we ask this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.